Um, it gives me a very great pleasure to introduce Stuart Galbraith, who I'm going to ask naive questions about promoting mostly because I'm very naive about it myself. So I just wanted to begin because of the session we just had, which has been um, some of our themes today have been about the relationship between the Academy or University Education and live music, live music business. And I should say, should say that universities are extremely important to the history of live music promotion, and that between Roughly speaking, 1964 and 1974, the live promotion business in Britain was transformed primarily by the entrance of a completely new sort of person who became a promoter because of their university education. And because of their university education, they've remained dominant in the promotional business ever since. And of course, the university education was not in live music management, or probably in any degree whatsoever. It was because they became a social secretary. And so going to university gave people an opportunity for promoting that they would otherwise not have had. And it was, I think it's worth people remembering it was not just in the promotional business that people were being social sex. Secretaries came into the business. Pretty well, significant swathe of the most significant record industry uh, from the 70s onwards will come out of that route as well. And one of the interesting things about transformation of the British music business in that period was simply the reorganisation of the age structure. I was talking to somebody the other day who went to work for EMI in around 1981 or so, and he said when he arrived, and he thought of himself as a whiz kid because he was 30. All his bosses were age 26. <laughs> and you know, it was quite, quite a transformation. Even 10 years earlier, that would not, have been, would not have been the case. And they were all, without exception, they have been social secretaries one way or another. They'd come in that room. So what I really want to, uh, I mean, we've got an account of, of Stuart's career in, in, in the program, but I really wanted, in a sense, sort of Stuart to kind of think about his own career for himself rather than just looking at the headlines. Because I'm quite interested to know how that career works. I mean, you came to Leeds, student, and became a social secretary, is that right? Uh, I came to Leeds in 1980, and uh, prior to that, I'd been to two concerts. Right. My, my, uh, my teenage career really didn't have a great deal of interest in music at all. Uh, I was stimulated by, uh, by coming to a city that had a vibrant music scene, and from the very first day, I went to a gig and was hooked. <laughs> So that's the value of university education. No, <laughs> so how did how did the I mean how did being so how did social book I mean how did promoters within universities work at that point? Um, well, it, well, first of all, it was amateur. Um, we were using student union funds, um, and uh, you're you're absolutely right. If you look at the core of, uh, of many of the, the uh, sectors of our live industry and recorded industry, there are innumerable names that you could say that. that uh, through that, that period of late 70s into perhaps late 80s, early 90s, uh, with social secretaries, so Harvey Goldsmith, John Giddings, uh, Paul Oversby, Barry Dickens, Rob Dickens, uh, a, a dozen of them. Um, but uh, it was very much um, uh, an, an amateur setup, uh, very much an enthusiast setup. Uh, but it was, but it was also at the time student unions formed the backbone of a touring circuit through the UK. Uh, there were no academy music groups, there were no there were commercial venues. Um, and at the time that I booked in Leeds, there was no other significant gig in Leeds or Bradford. Uh, I was very fortunate that Bradford St George's went on and burned down the year before. <laughs> um, um, and, uh, and so uh, we were given a unique opportunity for bands like U2 or Simple Minds or ZZ Top, uh, ordinarily of which we wouldn't have had that. So were you approached by agents or did you approach them or was it a mix of both? Oh, both. Uh, I mean, uh, um, the first weeks of the job, you wet behind the ears and, and uh, book anything that moves. Um, but uh, the the ambition was to try and make ends, as it was called at the time, break even, um, and uh, and not lose a great deal of money. Um, at the end of the year, unfortunately, I made money. Uh, was censured by the uh, student union because therefore ticket prices obviously were too high. Never, never ever appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it's uh, obviously overcharged those poor, <laughs> impoverished students and make £10,000 in a year. So, how did, I mean, did you have any lessons from like, your predecessor, or did you just simply think, I would like you to have us find out that phone number from the yellow? Uh, no, no, there was, very, there was very much a, uh, there was a secession plan um, okay. uh, within the Leeds setup, certainly. Um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why Leeds was so good in so much that it's it was really a carver. It was given to the people that were going to be best for the job. Right. Um, and there was a vote. Um, <laughs> as opposed to the model that then was in existence at some lesser uh, uh, colleges or universities in terms of their, their ability to run gigs, 
in so much that it was a paid for sabbatical or a, yeah. a commercial position. And, and if anything, that was probably the beginning of the end of the student union network, which is, is when it was taken out of the hands of enthusiasts and actually put into the bar manager's hands yeah. or, a, or a commercial operator hand, yeah. because then it wasn't about music, it was about how much beer you can sell. Right, well, you can see that very much against that university. Yeah. So, was it at that stage during that during that period that you decided this was the business you wanted to go into? Um, well, in the in the last year that I, I ran uh, or, or worked in uh, Leeds Uni, we had visiting providers come in. I was offered a job. I had to make the decision. Um, I finished my second year taking a sabbatical um, um, and uh, make the decision on whether. I saw myself working in a, in a research lab for the rest of my life, um, or, or did I want to try something uh, that, that seemed a bit more exciting? So, so I convinced my parents that uh, I'd have the uh, place at uni held open uh, for a year, and indeed did, uh, and then never came back. So, who was your first, who, was, who did you go to first of all then? Um, in terms of which band did I work with? First? No, which promoter, which company? Uh, MCP, um, which I then stayed with for 19 years and uh, uh, became a partner, we built it up, sold it to Robert Selman in 1999. So when you went into it, I mean, how how was your job, and what would have been your job description? Uh, what did they want you to do? Tour, tour rep, uh, work 20 hours a day and uh, drive the On the road, with, the on country, the road with Yeah. So you kind of start from the ground up, so it's... Uh, absolutely. It's, uh, um, and there was, certainly not now, but there was a point in time where when we were running an outdoor show, or indeed any show, uh, at some point or other in my career, I'd done everything that... Uh, um, was taking place, uh, being a steward, I'd run a PA company, I'd run lights, uh, I'd market it, uh, I'd rig, so he'd drive forklifts. And so that one, I was just reading, and again it comes back to what we were just talking about before you were here about whether there's any sort of training that makes sense for that sort of job, or whether it's by its nature you kind of just have to do it. Um, I, I guess it, it depends on, on what job you're talking about. If, it, if it's a rep on the road, then, then uh, yes, I think there is training. Uh, but um, I think to, to be a promoter, I don't think you can necessarily have any training for it. It's more about whether you just have uh, an innate uh, aptitude to work and a love of music, to be quite honest. So yeah, I was going to ask you that later on if love of music is necessary. Um, it's interesting, actually, we were going to have a chat with somebody earlier on, and, and, I, and I think it actually is. And, and uh, one of the problems that we now have as, a, as, a, as an industry is it's fantastic uh, that there are music management courses. Um, and I'm happy to say this in front of Steve and Simon, but <laughs> they've actually caused us a problem because it used to be the case that to find interns or, or new employees, uh, it was fairly straightforward because you were just employed by an enthusiastic person. Mm -hmm. But what we now get in, we now get inundated uh, with candidates and, and CVs, many of whom are, are great academic uh, uh, um, pupils, uh, but just don't love music. And, and the ones that we're looking for are ones that love music, and that's a much more important criteria for us than whether you've got a first or a two one, or indeed whether you've got a degree at all. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. And what about the more temporary? I mean, did you ever have any sort of, say, legal training? No, no. And, uh, uh, consequently, many lawyers have made a great deal of money <laughs> to, to sort out the problems that I've caused by stupidity. Right. So, would you rather you'd have? Or do you think that's a necessary part of it? Well, as I was just saying to Steve earlier on, my, my daughter is, uh, is currently doing uh, a degree in Nottingham for uh, management and business studies and has already worked out that's not what she wants to do. She's already signed up to, for a law uh, uh, degree and wants to be a, a, a corporate lawyer in the music industry. So, uh, so it's sure. absolutely fine by me. <laughs> <laughs> so, in building up, so <coughs> you went through MC, so you said you were there for 19 years. So was it a small company that got bigger? It was a small company that got richer. Got richer. Um, we, even when we sold, we were only 20 employees. Right, um, uh, albeit at the time, we were one of the, certainly one of the market leaders. Um, and we, turned, we were turning over, I don't know, 25 million pounds or something like that. Um, did you have any sort of specialism as a project? I mean, were you working in, in particular fields, or was that everything? Uh, no, we, we would literally turn our hands to anything that we thought we could make money from or, or um, uh, use our uh, skill sets. Uh, so that meant that we promoted anything from World Indoor Climbing Championships and Gladiators on the one hand, or Robot Wars through to Monsters of Rock, or indeed uh, Motor Racing. And, and for 12 years we took on the operation uh, 
and management lease for Donington Park Race. And did you have any, uh, did you see yourself as kind of regionally focused? Uh, no, we were, we were, although we were based in Walsall in the, in the West Midlands, we were certainly uh, a national promoter in the true sense of the word. So, so it doesn't matter where you're based for being No, I mean, look, look, at today, look at today's company from the SJM, certainly suffered nothing at all by being based in Manchester. It's, a, it's an unusual sector of the industry in some ways, and it seems to be less neat to be London centric. Yeah, I mean, I kind of industry. I think if you're based outside of London, you're, you're invariably going to do, do well on your frequent uh, traveller and on Virgin Rail, <laughs> uh, because by definition you're having to go to lots of evenings or, or meetings in London, but uh, you certainly don't have to be based in London. So why did you decide to sell out? Why did you decide to sell out? Because okay. it was a uh, there was a point in time where it became obvious that the industry was, was ripe for consolidation. Uh, it was going to happen uh, whether we wanted to be part of it or not. Better to be part of it than, uh, than not be part of it. Um, and it was a nice big healthy check. Right. <laughs> but why, was, why do you think consolidation was starting to happen? Um, uh, I think for the pure and simple reason that um, um, and, and that consolidation is carried on and still carrying on to this yeah. day. Which is that our industry was made up of lots of maverick entrepreneurial promoters. Uh, there was no tie up between them. Um, and by consolidating the margins and the, uh, the actual profitability of the business could be increased enormously. And indeed has it. Because there was certainly a period which, in retrospect, seems a remarkably few number of years when pretty well all significant main promoters in Britain seemed to become part of American or non British companies one way or another. Yeah, and uh, I've done both, and yeah. been, been in and out of both, um, and uh, and I, I think I think it's, it's, it's like any industry, though, and I don't think you need to, it, it's not unique to music, whether it be record companies, whether it be airlines, whatever. Uh, as, as you see consolidation come along, um, and that can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending upon your viewpoint. There'll always be a requirement uh, for an independent alternative. Um, and so I think you'll see whether, as I say, whether it be airlines or, or record industries being two good examples, you see very big conglomerates and you see very small entrepreneurial operations that are for both. So when you became part of SF, FS, FSX, mm -hmm. did it change what you did at all? Or was it, were you still operating just as much as you were with a different corporate structure? Or you uh, it gave, 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 us a whole, gave us a whole new set of tools, a whole new set of, uh, a whole new toy kit, as it were, <laughs> um, which, which certainly involved a great deal of finance uh, and access to global finance um, and so we were able to deal uh, at a much higher level um, and do much longer term deals and, and leverage those um, and uh, that's exactly what consolidation brings um, um, and it gave us an exciting period of time, it sort of gave me an exciting period of time where we could actually grow a brand new business um, to a, a much higher level than that had been achieved in the UK so far. Was that to do with the level of acts you could work with, or the kinds of venue you could work with, or well, we could national I mean, nature of touring? Or no, we could we could work at any level anyway. Right. Um, so I was trying to think, what was the yeah, no, was the new level? And prior to selling, prior to selling to SFX, we'd already done shows at uh, I think we'd done twenty five shows at Milton Keynes. We'd done right. two shows at Ramsey Park, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we were already operating at, at the stadium level. Um, what it, what it did was able to plug the UK element of a global tour into right. a global offer. Right. Um, right, so you could become part yeah, of the global tour absolutely, industry. Which, which, gave you, um, which gave you an advantage yeah. over the uh, competitors in the UK market. And did you find at that point that there were venue problems? Or were there enough venues in Britain to be able to do that at that point? Um, I am not thinking I'm sure anymore. I think, um, I think um, if you look at the UK music industry or the touring industry, uh, I started in the 80s uh, and there were I don't know, two or three arenas. Um, at that point in time, the biggest bands in the world toured through the UK playing municipal theatres. Uh, and if um, I don't know, I don't know, they burnt down, uh, if uh, ZZ Top wanted to play in Yorkshire, that we'd do the St George's Hall in Bradford. Um, or in Newcastle, we'd be squeezing five trucks of ACDC into the city hall. Uh, so there was, I mean, in the, in the 80s, uh, uh, certainly in the 70s and the 80s and running into the 90s, there were a lack of venues in the UK. Uh, the situation now is much better uh, with arenas. Um, and it's great to, to obviously see that Leeds is, is finally going to enter the arena marketplace. Uh, next year, um, and I think with 
the exception of a couple of conurbations now in the UK, noticeably uh, Bristol, which John mentioned earlier on, and I think I'd probably add Edinburgh to that as well. Um, and it's woeful that Cardiff has only got 6,000 capacity arena. I think the UK is now pretty well catered for. Right. And that's happened in the last decade, really. Yeah, it has happened, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Um, and and there, have been, there have been levels of arena development as well, if you're going to characterise venues as arenas. It's much yeah. that, uh, and again, and John, uh, he's in the room. Uh, New, Newcastle is, it was great that Newcastle got an arena, uh, but for 29 million quid you get a prefab. Um, for 700 million dollars you get the O2. So um, in the decades that have gone on, the sophistication and the quality of the business has improved enormously. And then you, from there you moved to Live Nation, what became Live Nation? Mm -hmm. Is that well, we, different sort of thing? We were SFX, we were yeah. general, and then we spun out uh, on the uh, down. Is that just journey. continuing consolidation rather than any particular changes? Um, it was, well, I mean, what then became apparent after 18 months was uh, uh, Robert's plan uh, was, was really just a roll up uh, to add value to it and then sell it on and uh, sold it to Clear Channel. Right. Uh, and then it was spun from Clear Channel into Live Nation. Did that make any difference to your working day? Um, no, not really, uh, if I'm honest. Uh, uh, the spin into to Live Nation certainly made me look at the stock price of my options uh, <laughs> on a daily basis. Uh, but other than that, it really made no difference to the operational uh, day to day. Right. And then you decided to leave? <coughs> yes, um, decided to leave um, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, I wanted to take the UK element of the company in a particular direction um, and uh, the resistance of that from America. Um, at the time, um, AEG didn't really have a great operational base in the UK. Uh, most importantly, from their perspective, uh, they were opening what was their biggest investment to date, which was the O2. Yeah. Um, um, and at that particular point in time, there hadn't been a single booking in at the O2 from Live Nation. Um, <coughs> so uh, it seemed to make sense that they would then try and take uh, uh, their destinies to their own hands and create a content provider in house. Uh, which is what we did. With them. So that was part of the AEG setup. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, st absolutely, still is. Although AEG are now in a very different scenario, which yeah. is that they now have a very successful building, in fact, the most successful yeah. arena in the world, and they have a different problem, which is that they have no dates uh, in terms of uh, trying to uh, uh, <coughs> uh, free dates up for activity. So um, AEG now are without show, without um, the biggest venue operator in the world. SMG are probably the biggest management company. Mm -hmm. SMG are probably the biggest owner. Um, and Live Nation are the biggest uh, content provider. Thank you to now marry up, which has left me the ability to then come out of the relationship with AEG and secondly independently. Right. Did you find AEG a different sort of company than Live Nation? Um, it's, it, it was quite interesting actually. There's an enormous number of similarities. Uh, and when you think of one as, as Live Nation as a publicly quoted number, uh, as a publicly quoted yeah. company, um, and uh, post acquisition after they bought Apollo Leisure and uh, MCP, uh, within the space of a year uh, we had employed 20 new accountants, um, and that was purely and simply to be able to deliver the, the monthly um, and uh, quarterly reporting requirements from a public company. Public company. Um, Phil Anshu turns AEG, 100% uh, privately owned. Um, Phil is worth $37 billion, um, which actually personally towards Live Nation. Um, and his private accountancy is even tougher than it is in a public company. His money is more important to him than a public company. <coughs> so, in that respect, they're remarkably similar. Right. <coughs> um, <coughs> Um, that was what I was going to finish talking about your career. But I don't know if I'm, does anybody else, anybody want to talk anything about anything that's come up so far that you want to add to questions to? Obviously, cover everything. Yeah. No, 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 more to come, don't worry. In that case, I want to move on to what is, for me, is a question that's always interesting. What does a promoter actually do? Well, take us through your day, your weekly routine. And why don't I take you through the. Um um, the concept of what we do on the start of a show to finish a show. So, yeah. so the, 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 um, the promoter is, is, in the live music experience, the promoter is the most stupid element of the equation, <laughs> in so much that the promoter is the only one that takes a risk. 
the promoter is the only one that stands to lose money while everybody else makes money. Um, and a pure promoting company, um, if you put it in front of an auditor or a due diligence process, uh, you'll then actually have uh, your, your auditors come in and say, so let me just get this straight. You risk this much money uh, to make this much money, and if it goes wrong, you lose all of it. Yes. That's and you've got no assets. assets. And you have no assets. And, and if you look at a typical promoting company, the margin is somewhere between 5 and 9%. Uh, it doesn't take a rocket science to look at. That's a stupid margin to work on. Uh, so there's no coincidence that, that the world's biggest promoter, uh, Live Nation, is also the world's biggest ticketing company. Yeah. Uh, and there's no uh, coincidence that the world's second biggest promoter, AEG, is the world's biggest venue operator. Um, and the reason for that is, is that they've taken content-driven businesses and content uh, businesses uh, which have a unsustainable margin um, and use them to vertically integrate into, into businesses that have got sensible margins. So when Live Nation and Ticketmaster merge, you're merging a 7% business into a 23% margin business. Um, and you look at AEG uh, and their operational margin, although not public because it's a private company, is in excess of that. Um, so, as a pure promoter, you, you've got to have the brains looked at. So, but, uh, so we, we're the bankers, basically. We, we, we book the venues, we book the, uh, uh, the artists, we take a, a guess on how many tickets are going to be sold. If we sell enough tickets, we make some money. If we don't sell enough tickets, we lose a fortune. There's two questions coming up. First is, how do you set ticket prices? Um, from experience, gut feel, uh, market indicators, uh, previous touring history, um, competition in the marketplace uh, in terms of other acts, uh, what's been successful in uh, particular regions, particular countries, particular territories, um, and uh, if, if anything, though, gut feel is the major. It is, it is major. And do you still uh, charge too much? Um, well, you have to understand that the ticket price is, is a function of the cost of running the show and the fee that the artist chooses to negotiate with us. So the promoter is very much an instrument of exterior factors or external factors. And I sat here and listened to John this morning say, oh, the ticket prices are all set by the promoter. Yes, I was yeah, well, guess what? The promoter has to pay the building rent. So if you put the rent very high, um, then we have to put the ticket price up to make the economic equation work. Um, and while John uh, says that the building doesn't have an influence on the ticket price, the building absolutely does have a building in, has an influence on the ticket price. Um, and if you look at uh, Manchester, uh, you look at arena rentals in the last five years, uh, they've gone up much more than uh, by an RPI. Um, and you're now also seeing uh, elements of funding coming into the UK arena industry I don't think are necessarily healthy and have been uh, extracted out of the American market. So you're now seeing buildings charging restoration charges um, or facility fees, um, the first of which uh, has, has already hit the UK in the Ambassador Theatre Group. Yes, um, uh, as of January next year, there's a one pound uh, facility fee being added into the O2 Arena in London. Uh, five years ago, SMG introduced a 1% box office charge in uh, Manchester. Uh, or whatever, we don't know. Um, they went open and just said we want more rent. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how the, uh, the, uh, the building is structured here at Leeds, whether it's just a pure rent, uh, or whether there'll be a facility charge, a restoration charge, or whatever. You will know. Uh, they, 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 <laughs> they are e they're either all added on to. Actually, I didn't even see it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, so whether you want to call it, whether you want to call it ticket price, whether you want to call it service fee on, on uh, booking fees for tickets, transaction charges, whatever, those are all influences that feed into the financial equation. And but the most, the most influential on them is the artist. Uh, so if, does the artist if the artist chooses to work at a low ticket price and take a lesser fee, then we'll happily do so. Uh, if we can run a, a low ticket price, chances are we can sell it easier and sell more. If an artist wants a very high fee um, and makes us premiumize the ticket price within that financial or within that uh, business plan, then we have to go high or walk away. So when the artist, when you're discussing with an artist, would actual ticket prices be part of the discussion? Or yes, you? absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, and you'd be amazed the number of times where uh, the artist actually argues the ticket price down 
uh, so that uh, effectively talking themselves out of a fee. No, we've noticed that in our historical work that even by the, by the mid 60s, artists were complaining that they were just charging too much more than they'd asked for. Yeah, it's, it's, um, but it, I mean, what, 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 is, what is interesting is to compare the European marketplace to the American marketplace, and, and the American marketplace has really suffered a, 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 a depression in the last uh, decade, and it's because there was an enormous escalation of ticket prices in, in the US. Uh, and I think that, to some extent, was one of the bad elements and the results of, of, of consolidation within the, UK, uh, within the US marketplace, because Live Nation actually became very dominant in very many markets. And the model in the US is very different in so much that uh, in the UK or most European markets, you have national providers, and in the UK, there are probably a dozen that you could name, all of whom can compete and can uh, promote in any city. Uh, whereas in America, it's very much regionalized. So you have a promoter per city, or you have a building that runs a city. Uh, and as such, there was no incentive to keep the ticket price down. Um, whereas I think as an industry, we've done a reasonable job in the UK and European markets, actually keeping our prices significantly lower than yours and protecting the market. In terms of your, I mean, you've talked about risk and um, if you don't sell the tickets, you lose money. Is, I mean, do you basically calculate this gig by gig, or if you look at the end of the year, would you, and would you be like a record company and say we've made sufficient profit on that, we can cover the losses on that? And do you see, is there a sort of slight cross subsidy going on, or is it not working? Uh, it's. I mean, the reality is, is that what's happened? That is what happens. Uh, but uh, I, I don't. A couple of noticeable exceptions. I cannot think of an occasion where I've gone into a show uh, on the basis that I expect to lose money. Right. I have more than enough gigs that we promote that right. turn out to lose money than having to go and gloss leaders. But would you, if someone was to say to you, being realistic, at the end of the year, what percentage of shows would you think you've lost money on? Would sure. you say none? I've heard, really. Mm -hmm. Has that yeah. always been the case, or has that changed? Um, you always try to be as careful as you can. Um, and I think as, as uh, the economic um, conditions have got tighter, you want to actually try and get that down. Uh, but I would still say, you know, I was looking at a sheet this morning, I'd still say 25% of our shows lose money. Right, that's interesting. And would you think that was kind of a norm for a yes. big promoter? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, going back to your kind of you said you can take from, from the beginning to the end of a show mm -hmm. in your job. I mean, do you mostly initiate? I mean, are you very much, are you there for someone to come and say, you two is available, do you want to do that at all? Or? Um, I, I think probably 50%, uh, as an established provider, I think probably 50% of my business comes to me and the other 50% we go and hunt. Relationships are very important. Um, and there are artists that we've worked with for many, many decades. Um, and there are managers that we've worked with and agents that we've worked with for many decades. Um, and you're as good as the last job that you do. Um, and if you fall out over something, then guess what? You don't know, you know, do that manager's next show. Right. So, um, but uh, it's, um, we, we're not, um, as I said, we, we, we're not a city promoter like, like the US model. We don't sit there in a, and have an exclusive with a building and everything that comes through that city will play with us. Um, we're, we're out competing with every other promoter. And would you ever, I mean, would you still take on things that are very small? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's absolutely essential. Um, and indeed, um, um, having started Kilimanjaro as a JV with AEG, one of, one of the reasons, or one of our differences uh, in, in ambitions with it was that I wanted to start a full service content promoting company. Um, that I knew would take probably a four-year business plan until we got to the point of a, of a mature uh, financial model. AEG's imperative, on the other hand, was that they wanted as many shows at arena level to put into the O2. Um, and so one of the things that we had to reconcile was, was my ability to lose money on small shows uh, and invest in promoters. Um, and that's still carrying on now. Um, and then if you look at some of the acts that we work with now, uh, we worked with Ed Sheeran for two and a half years. Um, his last tour went on sale, we sold 70,000 tickets in two hours. Uh, we worked with Katy Perry in, for three years. Our first show with her was at the Water Acts, which is 200 capacity in London. Uh, we worked with Marina and the Diamonds from the very start, etc., etc. Though the acts that you work with today in pubs and do 50 tickets with, uh, the acts in five years' time will be filling Leeds Arena. So you, and, and so you maintain relations with small venues? Absolutely, yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah. 
the entry level in at that, that point is, is much um, uh, easier to do in London. Right. Um, it's about gaining the relationship. Uh, it's about being the first promoter to be involved. Right. In that. Invariably, you don't have to do that on a national basis. Right. So we're not in here every week at Leeds Warehouse, or we're not in at York Phillips or the Cockpit or whatever. Right. Um, what we do do though is, is that we we sort of help an agent or a manager knit a tour together at that level. So we'll, we'll take the risk in London, you'd argue it's less of a risk, uh, but we will then put together a coordination on a marketing uh, national basis. Right. <coughs> um, I was say, do you go to every, how, how, what percentage of your life do you go to gigs? I'm still out three, four nights a week. Um, um, and to be honest, go to as many pub shows as I probably do arena right. shows because uh, uh, it's important to be seen to be there. It's important to be there at that early stage in the relationship. Right. Thank you. Um, before we move on, any any other questions? Yeah. I I asked a very flippant question. I yes. tried to get out. <laughs> and um, but actually, I was I was trying to make a serious point as well. Because when you talked about your student union experience and, and the union turned around to you as success and said you charge too much, that's often an accusation that's, that's made today that, that ticket prices are ha high. Um, and you really answered the issue about why they're set where they were, but I think part of that perception that they're high is a reason to not go to live music. Do you have a sense that that's the case? That people would go to more shows if they were cheaper. Is that something you should take seriously as a, as a promoter? I'm, I'm sure I'm sure if, it, some, if every gig was half the price, yes, more people would go. Um, but uh, try saying to Coldplay, for the good of the industry, you should work for half the amount of money that you, you've currently been earning. Or you say that to Andrea Bocelli, or you say this. The fact is, is that the industry is made up of a series of very small, finite careers. Uh, and, the industry, and when Coldplay have come and gone, the industry will carry on. But they need to make and are uh, advised by their management agents and business management that they are able to maximise their earnings in this way. So, it's, uh, is, there a, is there an industry responsibility, a social responsibility with each individual staff? No, there isn't. They're there also, to make, they're there to you make could also add, You could also add to that, because I was going to bring this question anyway. If you were to put on Coldplay for half the ticket prices, there will be an awful lot of tickets out there on the secondary market. Because the demand, the demand for those sort of acts is not so sort of bound by price. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. And, and uh, I mean, the, it's, an in, it's an industry interesting product that we sell because there's finite demand. Um, and, it, it's, uh, and supply and demand forces are as relevant in our industry as any other uh, market, uh, whether it be airlines, uh, uh, which is a great model. Um, and, uh, the, the airline industry is way ahead of the music industry in, in terms of how to uh, maximise its income but also be as fair as possible to the customer. Um, and if, uh, if I want to fly to Los Angeles tomorrow and only make the decision today that I want a club class seat, then I'm going to pay a fortune for it. Uh, if I've been sensible about it and planned it six months ago, then I'll be sitting there having paid a fraction of the cost. And the, the pricing algorithms that the airline industry use are absolutely brilliant uh, because they got to the point where everybody sits on an aeroplane knowing that everybody has paid a completely different flight price for exactly the same product and market forces have dictated that. So that might be the answer. Um, and uh, uh, you'll see customers that are picking up cold play tickets for 10 quid uh, and for the simple reason that others have paid 600. Now, our industry at the moment has not yet worked out how to do that. The airline industry has. Um, and at the moment, other people are doing that with our product uh, and making the money instead of the artists making the money. And I have to say that I think that's fundamentally wrong. Um, and it, it will be a correction that will come when technology gives us the ability to, to stop that happening. Um, in order to find the app that's going to be doing kind of edge sharing, level of business in three years' time, how many acts are you working with at grassroots level of 206 venues? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would say the hit rate, I would say, is probably one in ten. Uh, so for, for every ten pub shows we do that we hope go on to be something significant, 
uh, nine, nine disappear without a trace. Your record company in Britain as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. <coughs> So I'm just carrying on from that point you made there, you were talking earlier about uh, how the record companies used to be the investment vehicle for young bands. And I was wondering whether you actually ever look at those low level bands and say, okay, I don't mind losing on a tour or two because I know we're going to redo this. Uh, well, we've done that for 30 years. Uh, what, what's, what's now different though is, is that we actually will put longer term investment in. Um, and indeed, we've, we've got an artist that's gone on sale, uh, today I won't name her. Uh, uh, oops. Um, um, and we today we will have sold out Shepherd's Bush Empire. Uh, there's an artist we've now worked with for two years, uh, and the reason that we're still her promoter is not because we've done a great job in this particular instance, uh, although we have. Uh, it's because we sank 20 grand into her two years ago, um, and said, in return for this 20 grand for you to use this capital. Uh, we want to be guaranteed as your promoter for the next five years because um, and then once we've even when we've had that 20 grand recouped which to be honest is, is a relatively small amount of money uh, but without that she wouldn't have been able to go on and do what she did at the time so is that do you think is that just you or do you think other no no other companies doing it absolutely absolutely so they are in that sort of station yeah i mean, I mean the, the traditional funding model of the record company is, is much harder to well that that funding is much harder to come by you've even got money uh, funding models now where you've got VC uh, putting money into the plans. An artist I was talking to just yesterday who's got uh, city finance behind him. So. I was just going to ask a question that follows on from that. You said that, that, that that's a practice that promoters have been doing for, for several decades, if I understood No, 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 we've been losing money on tours. <laughs> 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 um, but we were not the funding, we were not the investment partner during those decades. Yeah. In the last five years, we have become increasingly so. I was yeah, just going to ask that because the sort of common sense perception is that that used to be the function of record companies, and that's something that promoters are now kind of replacing with something mm -hmm. that record companies are doing less of. But you sort of place that to be maybe a transition that cemented five years ago. Yes, yeah, so, so I, I think probably as money started, has started to tighten out, as the, the traditional source of record advances started to disappear, uh, then artists need new new funding models, and uh, um, they they either have rich parents, uh, they go out and do a, a job of work and fund it themselves, which is, is uh, very difficult, obviously. Uh, they can try the traditional promoter route. Uh, you've now got um, uh, investment funds <coughs> that put money into bands. Uh, you've got EIS schemes uh, now, and you've got private city individuals that, that, that fund bands. Yeah. I, could I ask a quick follow-on from that? Because something that's already always fascinated me in terms of uh, uh, baby bands, or whatever you want to call them, uh, bands that are just starting out of their career, um, is how much, when they get that support slot on an arena tour, uh, and they're getting their 50 quid or 100 quid and their expenses to be on the road much greater than that, that where they actually are able to survive is from the PRS 3%, you know, just from bands that I've been talking to. And I find that interesting because promoters <coughs> have a very antagonistic relationship, as, as I understand it, with, with PRS and that, and that 3%, and especially with the controversy over them, you know, debating whether they should have a, a rise in that tariff last year, which didn't end up yeah. happening. Um, but do you, do you see... Is there a tacit acknowledgement amongst um, you know, top promoters that the, that the PRS actually has an important function in terms of that 3%, especially for those low-level artists where they may be making 100 quid you know, in terms of their fee for the night, but they know that six months down the road they'll get that PRS check and they'll be able to pay for their band? Um, would, would they only get the PRS check if they've, they've um, performed songs that they've written? Sure, but I'm talking about the ones you have. And, uh, the um, I think the problem with the live industry generally in PRS is that I don't believe, and, and you can compare it to other collection uh, societies and say it's favourable, but I, it just doesn't seem right to us that, that they run such an extravagant operation in London, spend millions of pounds that they raise in administration, and it doesn't, uh, and there's much, there could be a lot more that go back to the artists that, that should be acquired, and, and I think it would be. Um, I think it's much more relevant for a band at that level, particularly now in their ability to get to their customer directly via internet and Facebook, 
that they actually fund their operation on the road by selling CDs, selling downloads, selling merchandise. Mm -hmm. and I think those are much more important income streams than, PR, than waiting for a PRS check that may or may not materialise. Emma, you? I was just interested in what the 20 grand was, was going on and um, whether or not any of it is actually going into the cost of the road itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, it's, it's purely and simply going into paying for on the road costs, crew, backline, um, secure, um, not security, uh, PA lights, just giving them the ability to tour where they, they currently couldn't afford that, that time couldn't afford to tour. Um, <coughs> I'm going to move on slightly to, to other aspects of things. I mean, when for you do festivals suddenly start becoming important? Um, the late 80s. Um, and, and to be honest, we were uh, we were somewhat naive and, and slow on the uptake. Um, in so much that uh, uh, an MCP we run, I think called Monsters of Rock, uh, for um, uh, since 1980, and that ran through till 1996. Um, we used to run that as a one-day concert, um, and it was a very <coughs> unsophisticated festival model. And if I look back at that now, while well, it was as much as we could do then. Um, our ability to uh, deliver a customer experience uh, and our ability to actually monetize uh, that as a, an asset for the company uh, was woefully uh, underachieved. <coughs> um, since then, the market is, is uh, well, certainly the sophistication of the festival has matured. The market has grown enormously in the UK uh, and in Europe. Uh, and now, I think, as an independent promoter, very difficult to exist without a festival ownership. Right. Um, it's the one piece of brand ownership that we have, um, and it's the one piece of, uh, when you sit down to do a budget or, a, or an annual forecast in October, it's the one thing you can put in the diary and say, well, we know that's going to happen in July, and we know what it made last year, so hopefully it will make that uh, in, in next year. Uh, when you sit down to try and plan a year, <coughs> um, six months out before it's even started, Invariably, you're sitting there with no artists on your on your uh, touring schedule at all. So, how long does a touring schedule planning go? Okay. I know it's very different. Diff uh, it varies. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll put pub shows on at three weeks' notice. Um, um, in wandering around Leeds Arena this afternoon, we're looking at something for September next year. It is quite a long way. Mm -hmm. Now, I was talking to the director of the Edinburgh National Festival, saying it's impossible for him to permit to put rock or pop bands into the festival schedule because that has to be planned something like two and a half years ahead in the festival world. Yeah, I mean, um, the and the classical world does have a longer lead time. Yeah. And the reason that it has a longer lead time is invariably it's not linked into a piece of product. Right? Exactly. So, so and also the competition for top stars is yeah, different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other question, I mean, to, to, to um, Jeff, the other question is about the most disastrous gig you've ever been involved in. The most disastrous gig I've ever been involved in. Mm -hmm. um, well, Maybe you don't have any. No, 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 all of us involved. Um, even as recently as two years ago, I had somebody die at a festival in Finland when we had a freak weather um, storm hit us. Um, in terms of performances, uh, I've had uh, Metallica turn up at Donington and tell me that the drummer isn't there uh, and, isn't, <laughs> isn't, and isn't coming. That, that was an interesting day. Um, so those of you who know Metallica and what Keith Helm and Lars is, <laughs> albeit arguably the drummers that day were better. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I pro pro probably more on a personal level yeah. than, a, than a commercial level. What about what's the best gig you've ever put on? Uh, best gig you've ever put on? I don't know. Um, sense of satisfaction, live aid in the high park. Um, even though we, even though I was uh, threatened with arrest for breaking curfew by an hour and a half as the licensee. Uh, to actually get that done at six weeks notice, literally the first meeting we had on Live Aid was uh, six weeks before the, the day the show took place. Um, 
we've had some challenging shows at Wembley Stadium when it first opened, the new Wembley Stadium. Uh, we did the first shows there with Muse, we did Lady Diana concert, we did Live Earth there. Um, but equally, some, some shows where uh, you've got only a thousand people at, uh, but have been very hard work in terms of selling those thousand tickets can be just as rewarding. Um, and now for me, uh, actually going to gigs that um, other promoters in the office uh, have picked up and taken and nurtured. So I was at Bournemouth Centre on Monday with example, and it was um, one of the people in the office's biggest gig today. I took an enormous sense of pride by seeing him progress that far. Mm. Now, we're in, when, we've, cause when we've been interviewing promoters, I've always been struck by if you ask them to name a good gig, they very rarely name the one that made the most money. <laughs> they tend to name a gig that was it works in every respect, and the money is in the secondary terms. Well, I, I think, to be honest, that comes back to, to the very, perhaps one of the very first points that we're making, which yeah. is that I think to, to really, um, or hopefully, be successful in the business, you still have to eat, you still have to have an enthusiasm for it. Um, and, and the best gigs are the ones where you stand on. Where you're standing at the bank and wandering, uh, you see 500, 1,000, 10,000, 50,000 people going crazy, uh, and you think, God, this wouldn't have happened if we didn't do it. And I still get hairs on the back of the neck moment, and I still get tears, and it's fantastic. And so uh, there are not many jobs that you could say you get that satisfaction from. Yeah, I can't have any that. What, um, I was going to two more questions I was going to ask you. The first was, which we were first, I mean, you, you've talked occasionally about. <coughs> customer experience, which is always kind of sort of what doesn't fill one's heart with joy, because it always feels like when you're in a gig, you don't think, oh, I'm having a customer experience. <laughs> <laughs> but the question I'm going to ask is, why do you think people go to live music? Because um, you can't steal it, and you can't replicate <laughs> it. Uh, and you, it's, um, <coughs> you, you can steal recorded music, um, but you cannot replace the experience of standing at a live gig. Um, the, um, e I mean, even just to say that you were there, even if it's a bad gig, uh, even even on occasions if you can't even see the stage. I mean, I've had I've had people come up to me and say, "Oh, I was at Oasis at Network in 1996. I was stood right at the back, couldn't see the stage. It was just brilliant, it was brilliant. I just watched it on the screen." And it's like, and, um, so so that that's the that's the reason people go to gigs um, because it is brilliant um, and. Um, can't do it sitting at home. Um, the other question I'm getting asked is very different, just again, something to come out of the album, which I've been doing. Because <coughs> promotion does still seem to be a very male industry. I wonder if that's, do you feel that's true, or that's just who you have to talk to? Um, yes, it is. I mean, the, the statistically, there's no, there's no um, denying that at all. Um, I, I, I think, though, perhaps. Um, is, is that because there are less women that are enthusiastic about music, like that much passion for music, I don't know. <coughs> <coughs> could, could well be. I've had, uh, I mean, there are now three, there used to for many years be one, one female agent in the UK agency business, Emma Banks. Uh, we now probably deal with half a dozen. Uh, none of the uh, level yet. Um, <coughs> is there a UK promoter that's female? Um, at this point in time, I don't believe there is one that works at a significant level. Uh, we used to have a lady that worked for us called Judith Atkinson, who then, then went on to uh, work at Dance Factory in Scotland with DM concerts and create Tea in the Park with Stuart. Um, and her and Stuart now live in New Zealand and going back for Arena. Um, but, um, I, I don't know. It's very, it's very difficult for me to give a judgment on whether there is a glass ceiling factor within within the industry, or whether there's a, a sexist or a sexism problem within the industry, or whether it's just that there are more men that like music or not. I don't know. We found one of the more interesting findings we had looking at 50s clubs, and we were often fronted by a man, but the woman was actually doing the accounts behind the stage, and right. keeping the business okay. going. Okay, well, I mean, um, but that, was, that was in small, small venues. Well, my head of marketing is female, my head of finance is female, my head of operations is female, so perhaps that's yeah. still exactly the same. <laughs> um, so, just to end, I mean, how, what do you think are the, what are the challenges now? I mean, 10 years' time, we'll be doing exactly the same thing? No, if we are, you're not going to be doing it. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's not an industry to stand still in. Um, and uh, I actually, I, I have, I have, probably have more excitement about the industry now than I have at any point in my career. 
for one simple reason that I think technology is going to transform uh, the live industry. Um, and that technology is just starting to hit now. Um, and it's going to, um, it's, it's not so much going to be internet based, it's going to be um, social networking based. Um, and it's also that technology is going to uh, provide our industry to have more of a, a control of our own destiny and an artist to have control of their own destiny. We've already said that an artist can reach a customer now much more directly, um, whether it be through YouTube, whether it be through, through uh, now increasingly Facebook or Twitter. Um, and that artist there <coughs> doesn't need funding in the same way that you used to have to have it from a record company. Uh, equally, arts, you're seeing artists now that are promoting their own tours uh, for the simple reason that because they've got that direct interaction, uh, they don't have to go through a retail chain, they don't have to go through a third party. Uh, you can then take your product directly to your customer. Um, and I think you'll see uh, the merging of technologies in several areas. I think you're going to see RFID is going to transform uh, ticketing. Um, uh, we already have print at home. Um, this summer you're seeing Samsung bring out the first uh, uh, RFID chip enabled phone. Uh, within two years your phone will become your life. It won't be called your phone. It'll be called, it's, your, it's going to become your electronic wallet. Uh, for those of you who live in London, you won't need an Oyster card because it's going to be your RFID uh, beat you're in. Uh, it'll be your ticket in exactly the way that it already is for your airline ticket. Um, all the venues will start having RFID scanners. You won't be barcoding. Uh, you won't need a credit card because you've already bought the card of putting stickers on the back of phones which are becoming your credit cards. Uh, it will give us the ability to deal with the customer directly on, on many, many levels. And it'll also link into social networking. Uh, so we won't be sending you emails, we'll be giving you Facebook messages, or you'll be part of a Facebook grouping. And there's already technologies now, or softwares coming in that we're running beta trials with, where as soon as I get you to engage with me on Facebook and you opt in, I can then data mine your, your network. Um, and uh, so We've promoted shows now for 30 years um, and we do market research when we launch a show and this TV ad produced this, this radio ad, this newspaper ad. At the top of that list every single time is heard it from a friend. So for the first time in 30 years we're actually going to know who those friends are. It's scary on the one hand, and you have, you have the, but, but it's also equally enormously exciting because it, it means that I don't have to do broadcast marketing. I don't have to take a radio advertising campaign. I don't have to do a broadcast. I can narrow cast and I can actually send it into the people that I know are already going to be interested in. Well, while you're in that mode, I wonder that we've seen the sort of um, world of sports disappear into pubs and this kind of thing in broadcast. Do you ever see the day when you'll be having a tour that shows are played in Leeds, but then you know, somebody sat somewhere else and they go out down a local pub and see it. Uh, yes, I did. I mean, and, and we've certainly already been through TV cinecasts. Uh, um, uh, I think to some extent it depends upon the requirements of the net networks and the broadcasters at the yeah. time. So there was a flurry of, of um, uh, live concerts in the UK when Sky launched um, now a couple of decades ago. Um, there was a mini flourish when 3D started to come into play. Um, and we've currently got um, four proposals in with artists for cinecasts, um, where we'll take the show and we'll broadcast it into a network of cinemas. Um, uh, well, not, not, so much, not so much the wiring of, of, of theatres, but I mean, uh, we've already done a couple of examples. Um, when I was with AEG, we did Black Eyed Peas, which went on a global cinecast, um, and we did one of the first ever Metallica Big Four shows, which we uh, cinecast out of um, uh, Bulgaria which literally went live to, I think, 750 cinemas around the world. Uh, we had a, you know, a cinema attendance audience of nearly 200,000 people. Um, and rather than sit in the pub, we had people in Leicester Square um, doing a mosh pit and a stage invasion to a Metallica gig in Bulgaria. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think um, it, it, it all has its place. Uh, at, the, at the end of the day, it's great you could do a Metallica mosh pit and, Rush the stage at the end of the, for the first time ever at Leicester Square Odeon, uh, but but at, but at the but at the same time it, it's not really the same. Is it? Yeah. 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 Y
really isn't going. Okay, last uh, question. Yeah, in the same vein, can you see yourself doing a two pack UK with the tour next year? Uh, no, uh, no, no, I can't. Um, al albeit, again, I mean, uh, it's amazing the amount of publicity that, that got. Uh, it's certainly not the first time that technology has been used, and indeed, it dates back to its Victorian or musical yes. technology. Um, it was the first time it had been done outdoors at a festival, uh, it first, but it's certainly not the first time it's been done with a dead person. Um, so I, I think there, there's, there's scope for it. I mean, there's been a show touring for decades that's had Elvis on the yeah. screen. Um, there's a show, in, there's, a, there's a Celine Dion show in Las Vegas at the moment that every night Stevie Wonder gets up and plays at the piano. Um, but uh, Tupac was perhaps the first contemporary, perhaps the, the highest profile artist. But uh, no, I don't see us touring holograms as a living person. Well, many thanks for yeah, Thank you for your time. Yeah.